when, when you're starting to build a company from scratch, there's a lot of hesitancy or fear to put yourself out there. When you remove that fear, um, and when you remove kind of any threshold to trying to make something happen, that's when things happen. Anirod, thank you so much for joining us. To kick us off, can you give me a 30 second pitch about who you are and what you do? Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Anir Joshi, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Valor Labs. Um, Valor Labs is an AI diagnostic company uh, that was founded to uh, help cancer patients navigate what is the right treatment pathway for them. If you had to explain what you're doing to like yeah. a 10 year old, what would you say? Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, the most base explanation of this is, you know, today, different drug options don't have a way to know what's more effective versus another. And what we do at Valar is really simplify that for the physician and make them have information in their hands as to this treatment is gonna be better than this treatment. So you should pick this treatment for this patient and this other treatment for this other patient. Because you know at the end, cancer therapy is very personal and each patient has a different tumor. Um, so we help guide and personalize uh, treatment pathways for them. Amazing, and Baylor Labs is on a big mission, and I want to get to that. But before we get there, I want to hear your story. How did you get into the healthcare industry? What are your passions otherwise? Yeah. And what is kind of the founding story of Valar? Totally. Healthcare has always been a, a passion of mine. And um, this is dating all the way back to high school where um, I started reading about retinal implants and cochlear implants and how we could use technology to actually bring back the sense of uh, sight and the sense of hearing to both deaf and blind people. And that was mind blowing to me because you know, we had amazing technology and we had progressed in so many different uh, fields, but healthcare was just beginning to reap the benefits of all of those technological advances. Um, so for me, from the beginning, it was always, the most exciting part was how can we combine different advances and new technologies to actually solve problems that we were seeing in medicine and healthcare. Uh, so I actually got started as a biomedical engineer um, in my undergraduate um, degree at, at Georgia Tech and uh, worked at a few medical device companies through that period, leveraging mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science and different facets of the medical device process. And you know, increasingly as I was going through that, um, one thing that I was beginning to realize more and more is we had you know, reached some of the physical limitations almost like from a basic sciences perspective when it came to the mechanical and electrical engineering side of things. But really where medical devices could be transformative um, was on the software side um, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and this was in some of the early days when machine learning was starting to be applied uh, to healthcare data. So um, actually got um, more and more into that pathway of you know, leveraging AI in, in, in healthcare. And uh, after my undergrad went to Microsoft for a couple of years really to learn how to bring AI systems to production um, and make sure that people and users could access low latency, high performance models. From there came to Stanford, um, where I um, wanted to continue my journey in being able to bridge uh, medicine with AI. And Stanford was a very unique environment because um, you had the medical school and the computer science department right across from each other. And there was a lot of crosstalk between the two groups where you know engineers and computer scientists were always with doctors building systems to help improve uh, healthcare in various facets. So that was a really exciting time. And that's when we got more and more deeper into this into this space. And I met my co-founders there. Uh, so Vishwesh Krishna and Demir Rabak, um, met them uh, while I was at Stanford. We were working in the same research group, um, building a lot of these systems. And um, the genesis of Valar was really, you know, we spent a year just talking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of oncologists um, and just trying to understand, you know, the technology was clearly there mm -hmm. from a computer science and AI perspective, but where were the clinical unmet needs where physicians could actually leverage those advances to improve patient care? Um, and what we realized was post the diagnosis of cancer, for majority of cancer patients today, there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to what treatment is the best for them. Mm -hmm. And this uncertainty is, um, you know, the medical oncologists feel it all the time, uh, and the patients feel it too. As to, you know, I have chemotherapy A, chemotherapy B, maybe immunotherapy, maybe surgery, but which one is really going to give me the best shot at, mm -hmm. at, at a cure? So, you know, genetic uh, testing and genomics sort of made a, a first pass at this and was helpful in really starting the revolution of precision medicine. But our realization was, you know, just 15 to 20% of patients have mutations in the genome that can actually guide treatment. 
So we took an approach of using AI and images of the patient's tumor samples to actually guide and predict what is the right treatment option for each patient. What was kind of the process of getting there and making sure that your AI is accurate yeah. and what kind of went into it? Yeah. Talking to oncologists, the research, yeah. perfecting the artificial intelligence. Tell me a bit about the process. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, AI uh, in medicine um, should be and is now being held to the same standard that, you know, new treatments or new, you know, genetic testing has been held to historically. And what that implies is large scale studies, which, you know, use hundreds or maybe thousands of patients uh, across the country, maybe across the world, to be able to you know, validate whether these systems work as they say they should. So we actually, you know, thanks to all our partners, our physician partners um, across the nation and across the world, uh, were able to validate our algorithms on over a thousand patients on over 30 different hospital systems across the world. And that allowed us to really demonstrate um, scientifically and medically to the physician community, but also from a, you know, AI perspective that when this algorithm makes a certain prediction that it's accurate and it's better than anything that's come before it. How does a patient get access to yeah. Baylor Labs tests? Fantastic question. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I feel like many new technology companies make, especially when they try healthcare, is they try not only disrupting technology, but they try disrupting workflows. Mm -hmm. And that is a recipe for disaster because you know, at the end, the medical workflows and medical um, and uh, you know systems that hospitals are used to have been built in a certain way over decades. And if you're trying to change something, it's better to start with changing one thing versus changing everything all mm -hmm. at the same time. So, for us, the approach that we took is let's take let's make this so simple and so and and fit workflows so perfectly that any hospital in the in the U.S., whether it's you know the community uh, hospital down the street or you know, the, one of the best academic hospitals north of here, Cleveland Clinic, like all of those folks could use the same technology. And the way we did that is luckily we had the um, good fortune of coming after the genetic testing uh, uh, revolution, okay. which had a proper workflow for all hospitals to leverage diagnostic testing. So we slotted into that same workflow that hospitals use today for, for patients for genetic testing for our diagnostic testing. So from a hospital system and a, a physician perspective, it's exactly the same workflow they've been used to for the last 10 years. But behind that is really revolutionary new technology that'll bring biomarker testing and precision medicine to way, way more patients. Does it work with like insurance companies and are they reimbursing patients for the tests? Yep. So, uh, so diagnostic testing typically goes through the pairs, uh, okay. at least in the United States, uh, where um, pairs uh, like Medicare and commercial pairs will reimburse for the use of these tests uh, by patients. And then globally, it's a mix. I mean, you know, some countries are more cash based, some countries are pairs, but yes, in the U.S., majority pairs. Is there sort of a case where you would work with? Pharma companies? There is, yeah. So in, in a number of, uh, it's, it's a great question. In, in a number of ways, uh, pharma companies are interested in what we're building and for, for a number of reasons. So one, you know, pharmaceutical companies are tr always trying to uh, push the, the, the needle in terms of uh, improvements in treatments, giving more treatment options to patients. Now, in order for them to do that, they'll need to know, you know, who is the right patient population who will benefit most from a new therapy that they're bringing to market. And the way they can find that out is using tests like ours, because we've developed our tests to understand who are the responders and who are the non-responders to standard of care today. And the folks who are non-responders to standard of care today are really the folks who need new therapeutic advancements and who will benefit the most from it. Um, so that's where actually um, there's a lot of interest even from pharmaceutical Amazing. companies to use this. And right now, if I'm correct, you're focused yeah. on bladder cancer. We are. Are you going to start you know, looking at other areas of cancer as well? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's very appreciated. Like, um, so bladder cancer um, was, was where we got our start. We um, put out the first AI test in bladder cancer to predict response to an age-old uh, therapy that's been used for the last 20 years um, in, in the space. Um, and the idea was, can we identify those who are non-responders to this? Because there's so many new therapies and so many new alternatives who are coming to market where patients can benefit from that. But this is a platform that fundamentally is pan-tumor and pan-cancer. Um, and we have already published a number of other um, cancer types as well, uh, like pancreatic, ovarian, et cetera. Um, and we are looking at the whole spectrum of solid tumors that exist. Amazing. So there's a lot of really smart people in science, in healthcare, who work behind the scenes. Yep. Not everybody 
wants to become, become an entrepreneur yeah. because that's its own journey. That's running a business. What made you take the lead? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think, you know, when I first got started, um, you know, in high school and, um, uh, and uh, my undergrad, I actually wasn't focused on doing this in an entrepreneurship sense. It was more like uh, through industry or through academia, can I build these systems? And then what I increasingly realized was neither academia or big companies, um, big medical device companies or big tech companies would be able to actually bring these technologies to market and scale it in a way that patients will get access to. So it is almost a force of necessity that if we needed to bring this technology to market, we had to start our company to do it. Um, and that was sort of you know, the driving um, motivation to, to start a, uh, you know, a company and uh, was we strongly believe this was something that was needed um, and physicians would benefit from it. And the only pathway to doing that was starting a company. Now, um, you know, we, uh, as well, one of the things that I think is the beautiful part of Silicon Valley and, and even like the Stanford ecosystem is it lowers that barrier um, to entrepreneurship, which is, you know, there's always a mental barrier for a lot of folks of starting a new company, you know, venturing out into the unknown. And I think what is beautiful about that environment, that ecosystem, is you see others do it and that kind of mentally lowers the barrier for a lot of people saying, hey, that is, you know, this isn't as scary as folks may actually think. And, and um, it makes more people take the leap. Um, and I think that's a good thing, especially in, um, it keeps, you know, the, the US and one of the leading powers here. You know, the other piece that is needed when you start a company is you need great co-founders uh, and you also need great investors. Um, and that's something that we got very lucky on, on both fronts. Um, I didn't want to start a company until I met the right group of people. Um, and I did, I, was, I had a good fortune meeting my co-founders uh, in grad school. Um, and our investors as well have always been very long-sighted uh, investors, um, Pair VC, Andreessen Horowitz, and DCVC. They have always had a long-term vision of where this is going, and that's also highly beneficial to companies like ours and, and really makes this thing possible. What are some of the lessons learned yeah. so far in running a business? Yeah. So I think, yeah, I mean, one of the, 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 the uh, you know, this may, this may sound, um, you know, tongue in cheek, but it's not as, you know, a lot of people initially, when you, when you go zero to one, when it's the first, when, when you're starting to build a company from scratch, there's a lot of hesitancy or fear to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. But that is the, you know, putting yourself out there is, is what actually ends up driving things and making things happen. We weren't physicians, we weren't oncologists coming into the field. But now over the last three years, we've been able to develop connections and, and collaborations with over 200 plus physicians. And part of the reason for that is initially, even just cold emailing, like things that would feel like, oh, would they really respond to me? Would they know who I am, this, that? Like at the end, like when you remove that fear um, and when you remove kind of any threshold to trying to make something happen, that's when things happen. And I think like a lot of people um, and myself included, I think when I look back, that's some of the things that, you know, helped us from those very early days. Now. Now, as you start scaling, one of the, the things that we, we began to realize and, and began to um, you know, understand is like, you know, building the team is the biggest part here. Is like, you, know, you can have amazing technology, you can have the right business model, um, and everything could be perfect, but at the end, you need to build a self-sustaining engine uh, to, to function, especially you know, at, at an executive level. And you know, one thing that we want to be able to do is really build Valar into an engine both from the technology side, but then also from the um, you know commercial side and the company side to be able to run uh, and continue to generate new and new diagnostics for every part of cancer. And yeah. I imagine you know letting go of that fear, cold emailing people, yeah. putting yourself out there. That's how you raised twenty six million in funding today. But tell me a little bit more about that. Tell me about the very first round you raised. Yeah. And how you went about pitching yourself and were there yeses and nos? I want to hear all about it. Yeah. yeah so it's a great question. So. Um, you know, uh, we, we went through, the, so the first check-in to, to Valar was from Pair VC, and that was a pre-seed investment. We were part of their accelerator program over the summer, and then we went on to raise our seed round with Andreessen Horowitz and Vinny Dagarwala and Jay Ragani um, a few months after that. And in that phase, I would say, you know, one of the lessons that Paige Mon, he's one of the founders of Pair VC, told us is uh, fundraising is like uh, a soccer game. Um, it's you know, all 90 minutes count, 
And even if it's zero, zero or one, one till the 90th minute and you get a goal in the in extra time, it, it's still a win, right? And, and that's all that matters. Um, and I, I will say that that, that, was, that was very true. I mean, we, we obviously, you know, had, had um, a gr great number of yeses from amazing partners um, who are very fortunate to be able to work with. But we had a lot of no's. We had a lot of no's. Um, and that's very common here in, in, the, in this field. And it's something that I think, you know, folks just need to, to recognize and realize is not everyone's going to, you know, um, resonate with what your idea. Not everyone's going to be a believer. But when you find the right person uh, who believes in the technology, at that point, it's it's magical. So I love that. Yeah. That's, that's a really great answer. But is 26 million enough for the big mission you guys are on or do you need to raise more money? Yeah, I mean, so for our current targets and where we're going today, so right now, you know, uh, Vesta is uh, our first bladder can our first product uh, in bladder cancer and our goals are scaling that out while also bringing a few new products to market. For those aims, it's definitely sufficient. Um, however, to be, you know, the next, um, uh, you know, billion dollar company in cancer, we will definitely go through more uh, rounds of financing and, and more fundraising because at the end, these things are capital intensive um, uh, companies to build, mm -hmm. but when they work, they work in a huge way. So Amazing. Other than AI, yeah. which you are clearly, you know, using for the benefit of healthcare, what are your predictions for other trends that will be relevant to the healthcare industry in these next five to 10 years? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I will say pretty much any, the, the way to answer that is you look back at the last five years of technology mm -hmm. advancements in any other field, and healthcare is going to benefit from all of that because very few of those have even trickled into healthcare yet, um, which is you know the, the the unfortunate part, but also the opportunity, right? So as you said, AI is going to completely change and create an abundance of healthcare. And, and this is across all domains, not just you know, for what we do at Valar, but even, even throughout the stack with you know, summarization of physician notes to reduce burnout, uh, being able to provide you know, expert uh, pathology, expert radiology opinions um, for hospitals that may not have it. Um, all of that is gonna completely change with, uh, with AI and it'll be an incredible opportunity for both patients and, and providers. Um, beyond that, I think you know, one of the things that I'm actually quite um, excited about is even the uh, you know robotics and when it comes to surgeries and um, we're starting to see more and more of that come in and the combination of robotics with software where we have now a better way to visualize what's happening inside the body a better way to actually um, guide in uh, these uh, these robotics um, and help them actually influence the rest of the stack so for example things that we do involve collection of biopsy material from patients and very, sometimes it's very hard to collect these biopsies because they're in very small parts of the body, which is really tough to get to. Um, and as we get better and better with, you know, non-invasive surgeries and robotic surgeries, yeah. it's going to fuel the whole e ecosystem. Yeah, so. I, I, I'm very excited yeah. to see what happens next. Yeah. I'm curious, is Vedar generating revenue yet or... Will they come later down the line? Yeah, so there, there are different like uh, revenue streams for the company. Um, one, as you uh, you know pointed out before, is a pharmaceutical revenue, yeah. which um, you know uh, is through existing products. Um, then there is the clinical revenue, which requires Medicare reimbursement in order to get to get to. Um, we're we're a few months off that. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, these technologies take about a year or so to get to sort exactly. of um, insurance coverage, Medicare coverage, etc. Um, but on other facets of the business, um, we're there. Amazing. My last question for you, looking at everything you've achieved so far and how you're helping the healthcare industry and being an entrepreneur, what would you say to your 15 year old self? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, when I look back, I would say um, where what we're doing today and, and what um, uh, you know, Valar is focused on and, um, and what I, I have the incredible uh, opportunity and, and very fortunate to have is sort of exactly what I was looking for when I was 15, uh, was an, an, an ability to actually be able to use everything I'd learned to make, uh, bring new technology advancements to healthcare. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I'm just incredibly grateful to, to be able to, to, to be sitting here and, and being working on exactly that. So. Um, if there's anything I would tell the 15 year olds, like, it's coming. <laughs> just, just That's wait. it, it's coming? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, all right. Well, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. 